All right, so I've got a little lecture here on external anatomy that I want to go over very quickly. And uh, I try to make it clear, you know, what I want you to know and what's not as important to know. Um, and this is going to be very useful, not only as we just talk about fish, but when you get into the key, you know, the key is going to talk a lot of using these anatomical terms, especially for the external anatomy. So that's why it's important for us to know this. So, um, you know, we've got some different kinds of fishes, uh, your lampreys, your cartilaginous fish, your bony fish. And so we want to know a little bit from each of those. So this is a figure, and in these figures, the, the highlighted terms are the ones that I'm going to want you to know. And you can see that with your lampreys, you don't have any paired fins. Um, you'll see something that's common to all these fish and that we sort of divide them into the head, the trunk, and the caudal region. Let me get my pen out here. Right, head, trunk, and caudal. And caudal is another word for the tail. Um, so you'll see that repeated on many of these fish. You'll note uh, the lampreys have multiple gill openings. Um, the muscles on the side are called myomeres, and we're going to see that term come up in some of the other fish. The mouth of the adults is called the buccal funnel or the oral disc. Um, and for some of these adults, looking at the circumoral teeth is what we're going to use to identify them. Uh, the urogenital papilla and opening is um, just what it sounds like. So that's your basic ex external anatomy of a lamprey. Here's a cartilaginous fish. And again, you see, um, I want you to know all these terms, most of which, or all of which are pretty easy. Excuse me. A um, couple things of note that in your cartilaginous fish, at least in the spiny dogfish, you have a spiracle. The spiracle shows up in a couple of other bony species, but it's not common in the bony fish. But it's just um, kind of an extra opening to the oral chamber um, for allowing water in to get past the gills. Um, just as the lamprey had multiple gill openings, the cartilaginous fish have multiple gill slits. Um, you'll notice the names of the uh, fins. We've got the dorsal fin. And in this, the dogfish here, it's separated by the anterior and the posterior dorsal fin. The tail fin is called the caudal fin. Um, the pelvic fins are down here where your pelvis would be. The pectoral fins are up closer to the head where your pecs would be. Um, note that most cartilaginous fish also have a single anal fin down here. Um, I'm not sure... I guess the spiny dogfish doesn't have that, but most cartilaginous fish have that. Most of the time, we're going to be spending our time with bony fish, and so we're going to use those for most of our examples. Uh, we need to make sure that we have all our terminology correct. So the back of the fish is the dorsal, the belly is the ventral, head, anterior, tail, posterior. Um, if you look at the external anatomy of bony fish, um, you just need to know all the terms on this figure. I've also added one. Um, so if you look up here at the head, the head, again, we go head, trunk, caudal region. So head, trunk, caudal region. You see the head is from the tip of the nose to the back of the operculum or the gill cover. The caudal region is from the start of the anal fin all the way to the end of the fish and everything in between is the trunk. You'll note that we've got a little divot here. The back part of the skull is called the uh, uh, occiput or occiput. And then what I've added here is the nape. And the nape is this area um, a little bit posterior to that. So uh, kind of between the skull and the dorsal fin, we call that the nape. And so that comes up in the key quite a bit. You'll notice that whereas in the cartilaginous fish, we had the anterior dorsal fin and the posterior dorsal fin. Here we've got the spinous dorsal and the soft dorsal. Now, not all bony fish have two dorsal fins, but if they do, the front one 
will be supported by stiff spines and the posterior one will be by soft rays. If they only have one, it's usually just soft rays. Um, this narrow area here that connects the caudal fin to the trunk is called the caudal peduncle, caudal peduncle, which I think is just one of the coolest anatomical names there is. Um, again, you see the anal fin, which was not in the last picture, but you can see it here. Again, you can see these lateral muscles are called myomeres. And so that's just the name of the muscle, like you've got your bicep and your tricep, but the myomere is just the name of the muscle. Um, the belly is the ventral surface of the fish that runs up to where the pelvic fin or the, the pectoral fins um, are attached. It's, it's um, separated from the breast. And now I would say where the pelvic fins attach is probably the the line between belly and breast, but I'm not, you know, it's not well defined. But in the key, sometimes they'll talk about scales on the belly or scales on the breast. And so you need to kind of just relate that to your own anatomy. Um, you'll notice that the pelvic fins in this picture are in the thoracic position. Um, so the thoracic cavity is the cavity that contains the lungs and the heart. And so these pelvic fins are more anterior and that's the thoracic position and later on we'll see some species that have pelvic fins back here more posterior and that's the abdominal position um, the isthmus if you think about your geography an isthmus is a point of land that sort of sticks out in the water and so if you turn the fish over and look this isthmus kind of connects the bottom of the head to the trunk but it comes to a narrow point um, and the uh, gill cover is called the operculum or the opercle or the gill cover. All right. Uh, we also notice on here we label the uh, nostrils, which are called nares in fish. Um, and here again, I mentioned that the thoracic position for the pelvic fins is the more anterior position. Um, in the lamprey, we mentioned the urogenital opening. You can see that in this example for bony fish too. Sometimes there are fleshy lobes that cover the urogenital opening and those are called papilla or genital papilla. Uh, sometimes those are used to help identify the fish. Sometimes they're used to help identify the sex of the fish. Of course, the urogenital opening is a common opening where urine and gametes um, can exit the body. Um, and then in this particular example, these are right next to the anus. Um, the anus is always anterior to the urogenital opening, but they're often, um, most of the time they're found close to one another. Uh, I know in some fish, the anus is found very, um, anterior up in the throat region. And, um, we'll have to look, I'm, I'm assuming that the urogenital opening is up there too, in those species. Um, here's a special kind of fin that only a few species have. Here in Kentucky, it's just the catfish and the trout have this adipose fin. You may be familiar with the term adipose. Adipose uh, usually means fat. That's because I think originally this was thought to be a, you know, uh, to store fat or to be made of fat, but it's not. It's a little muscle, um, but it's still called the adipose fin. And then here you'll notice in this particular drawing, the pelvic fins are set more posterior and so that's the abdominal position they're showing a little thing that shows up in some species it's just a little projection above the pelvic fin called the axillary process and it's just a little um, kind of fleshy thing that just kind of sticks out okay so when we look at the fins we have um, paired fins so your pectoral and your pelvic fins are paired. You've got one on either side. And then you also have the unpaired, the singular or the median fins. Median meaning middle. And these are all mounted on the midline of the fish if you look um, dorsally. And so that's going to be the dorsal fins, the anal fin, the adipose fin, and the caudal fin. You'll notice one interesting thing is that the dorsal fin um, can be highly modified. 
And so you can modify any of these fins, but we often see the dorsal fin is the one that is often modified in interesting ways. So for example, on this remora, the front dorsal um, is turned into a sucking disc so they can attach to larger fish. In the angler fish, the dorsal fin is completely reduced to just a single ray with a little lure on it that sometimes is bioluminescent. And so it attracts its prey closer so they can eat them. Um, here's an example of a fish found locally. This one, this is me holding a fantail darter. A close relative of that is also the lollipop darter. And you can see that the front, uh, the spinous dorsal fin on this darter has these large bulbs on it. And in this diagram, you don't see it as much in this drawing here, um, but those are egg mimics. And so often the male will have these egg mimics during breeding season. Um, when they spawn, they lay their eggs on the underside of rocks and they stick them to there. And then the male sits here and guards the eggs. And so by extending this dorsal fin with these egg mimics, it makes it look like he has more eggs than he really does. And so that might be more attractive to a female. That's presumably why they have these egg mimics. And so it's a certain group of darters um, that does this. In some species, you have finlets. So in this tuna, you've got these little, small, stiff fins that run along the caudal peduncle, and uh, those help for um, hydrodynamic efficiency. Okay, so when we work with fish, we're going to take a lot of measurements. When you get in the key, a lot of times things are going to be relative to the size of the fish, and so you need to know how to properly determine the length. And there's three basic lengths we can get off a of fish. The first is total length. So you start at the tip of the nose and you go to the tip of the tail. But whenever you lay the fish down, you have to squeeze those tail lobes together and you take the farthest point that you can. We often use something called a bump board, which is a, a vertical board that the fish's nose is bumped up against and then there's a ruler mounted underneath that. Um, if the fish has a forked tail, sometimes we'll measure fork length. And so in some species, this is the appropriate measurement. Some species have what's known as a heterocircle tail, where one lobe is longer than the other. Um, and so the tip of the fork is a more reliable measurement. Or sometimes during spawning, the tail gets beaten up and gets eroded. And so using the total length is not as accurate, there's a lot of more variability just because the tail is, is eaten away from digging a nest or fighting or things like that, whereas the, the fork can be more reliable. But not all fish have a forked tail, and so it's very commonly used, especially in ichthyology, especially in the keys, is the standard length. And so by using the standard length, you don't have to worry about is the tail, you know, if the tail's eroded or not eroded, the standard length can be used. Um, with less variability. The standard length goes to the from the tip of the nose to the last hyperal plate. And we'll look, uh, in the next lecture, we'll look at the fish skeleton, but the hyperal plate is the last element of the skeleton. And so um, that's where you want to measure to. Now, it's a skeleton. How do you tell where that is? Well, if you just slightly bend the tail, you can easily see where that skeleton ends. And that's what you use for standard length. Okay, um, here's just some different body regions or other external anatomy. And again, know all these. Um, once again, we repeat some of these. Here you've got head, trunk, tail. Um, now you can see here, it's kind of arbitrary where they measure the tail from, right? Before we said start um, with the anal fin, uh, there's no hard and fast rule. You just get the idea. If I tell you the trunk or the tail or the head, you know where to look, right? Uh, you've got branchiostigial membrane labeled here. This is the membrane that is supported uh, underneath the gill chamber, and it's very flexible, and it allows the opercular chamber to expand and contract. Some fish have barbels. Uh, in catfish, we call these whiskers, but the proper term is barbels. <coughs> Excuse me, these are sensory 
lobes that are at the uh, anterior portion of the fish. Lacrimal usually means tear, and so the lacrimal area is where a teardrop would be, or it, it's associated with the eye. And so a lot of times we'll look in the lacrimal area for things like sensory pores. The snout is the tip of the nose to where the eye starts. Interorbital. So if you don't remember some of these terms, you can figure them out by just breaking them down. Inter is means between, orbital, orbit always has something to do with the eye. So it's the area uh, near the eye or between the eye and the um, head of the fish or the uh, between the, you know, what would you say, the edge of the fish and the eye. The cheek is sort of where you would imagine your cheek being. Um, usually when we talk about the cheek of a fish, we're talking about this area immediately below the eye, but not on to the gill cover. And it's not always easy to see where that is, but usually we make a distinction between the cheek and the operculum and consider those different regions. Um, again, if you don't remember what this is, you can figure it out. Pre-opercal, pre means before or in front of. And so a pre-opercle is going to be in front of the operculum. And so often the operculum has a hinge in it um, and that separates into the preopercle and the operculum. Some species also have kind of a hinge uh, down here at the bottom and call it a subopercle. Uh, most bony fish have a lateral line, at least some form of lateral line, and this is a sensory organ that's used for sensing nearby vibrations. And here's your caudal peduncle again. Some other terms that we're going to run into, um, just again, mostly when you're using the key, you need to be able to describe uh, where you're looking at on the fish. And so we're talking about not only the location on the fish, but a portion of a fin. And so, for example, um, we're talking about the origin of the dorsal fin. Um, that's where the dorsal fin starts. The margin is the outer edge of the fin. Basal, or the base, is the base of the fin. It's pretty straightforward. Um, insertion is where a fin attaches. Now, what's different between insertion and origin? Insertion is for a paired fin. And so a paired fin is sort of inserted into the fish, whereas a median fin um, is just attached and we can talk about where it starts. And so that's a subtle difference, but that's kind of the way the language is used. Um, distal and proximal are the same as they are with any animal. Distal is away from the body, proximal is toward the body. And um, here are those terms again. So the most anterior attachment point of a median fin is going to call the, we're going to call that the origin. The most anterior attachment point of a paired fin is the insertion. So the difference is just whether it's a paired fin or a median fin. Uh, the margin is the outer edge. The base is where the fin is attached, um, or the base is what it sounds like, the base. Distal is away, proximal is toward. Uh, one of the ways you'll see this a lot in the key, especially in cyprinids or minnows, um, is the relationship of the origin of the dorsal fin to the insertion of the pelvic fin. So you see how we use those terms differently because you've got um, a median fin and a paired fin. And so in the top example, the origin is posterior to the insertion of the pelvic fin, whereas in the bottom example, the origin is anterior to the insertion of the pelvic fin. All right. Uh, we also have several different ways to describe the shape of fish, and we can't describe every fish this way, but these are the most common ones and the ones we're going to run into. And so your typical, what you call your typical fish shape or your bass-like shape, uh, kind of long and slender and oval in cross-section, that's called fusiform. A fish that is squished uh, top to bottom is called depressed um, dorsoventrally flattened, you'll see sometime, but depressed is, is usually more common. And again, if you look over to the right, you see the cross section. The cross section of a depressed fish is kind of an oval, but turned on its side. Uh, a fish that's squished 
left to right is called compressed um, or laterally compressed. And again, you've got your oval, but your oval is now squishier. It's taller and skinnier. A fish that's like a tube that's just circular in cross-section is called terete or globiform. And so you see how this is a little bit different from depressed. It's a, almost a perfect circle when you look at it head on versus the depressed, which is kind of squished. Um, another type of body shape that we're going to run into is called angiaform. Uh, this is an eel and freshwater eels are in the family Angiidae. So anytime you see that kind of root word, Angiaform, Angiidae, you want to think eel. And so, um, you know, very unique slender shaped fish with long dorsal fin wrapping around. Now, there's so many species of fish. Again, you can't come up with a name with every shape. And so here are some good examples of fish that just have their own shape. And if you look at their cross-section, their cross-section is very different, or their cross-section is different depending upon which part of the fish you take the cross-section from, or you have something like a seahorse, which is, what are you going to do? Okay, we also have some terms for the shape of the tail. If we want to describe the shape of the tail, and you got all kinds of different tail shapes. Uh, a nice, straight, flat tail is also called truncate. A flat tail with just a little dip in it, like that one, is called emarginate or indented. Um, if that dip gets noticeably deeper, that's forked. Uh, round is what it sounds like, rounded. Lanceolate is shaped like a lance, and so it's wider at the base and then tapers off. And here um, we repeat some of those, rounded, truncate, emarginate or indented, forked. But here we also have moon-shaped or lunate, right? Lunate, you think moon, this looks like a moon. All these tails can also be described whether they are heterocircle or homocircle. I mentioned that term earlier. Hetero, of course, meaning different. Homo meaning same. And so this is basically, do they have differently shaped lobes or the same shaped lobes? And so you see in this fish, uh, it's got a very long upper lobe and a short, stubby bottom lobe. That's heterocircle. In this fish, it's evenly shaped. You can split it down the middle, fold it over, the sides match. That's homocircle. Now this fish, this is a bowfin, um, and so if you look at it externally, it looks homocircle, right? It looks even, like you could fold it over. But if you dissect them and look at their internal anatomy, you can see that the end of their um, vertebral column points up. And, uh, and so it's actually um, a heterocircle tail. Uh, this is a kind of a transition fish between uh, more primitive fish and, and more recent fish. And anyway, so that's a special case where you wouldn't think it was heterocircle by looking at it. But when you look at the skeleton, you can see that. Um, here's another example of a heterocircle tail. You can see the large lobe on top, the small lobe on bottom. Uh, some fins can be described as falcate. Falcate means sickle-shaped. So think, think of the, the hammer and sickle. And so you've got kind of a sickle shape here. You've got kind of a sickle shape there. Uh, so that turns up sometimes. Okay, the fins... Um, have to be supported by something. They're a thin membrane with some structure in there. And usually they're supported by rays. That's what we call them the ray fin fish versus the uh, lobe fin fish. Sometimes you have a stiff element, which we call a spine. Now, technically, are they, from, are they, are they of different origin? I'm not sure. Technically, a ray is two points joined together, whereas a spine is one point. Uh, rays can be noticed because they're made of segments, and if you look at these pictures, you can see all the little segments in the rays, whereas a spine is not segmented. Rays are usually soft. Spines are usually stiff. Um, it doesn't really matter too much. Um, in general, what we say is, you know, if it's 
stiff and it hurts when you poke yourself with it, we're going to call it a spine. And if it's soft, then we're going to call it a ray. So here's an example showing a ray versus a spine. And you can see kind of the two parts that make up the ray. Um, whether or not a spine is just a derivative of a ray, I'm not sure about that. But, but really what's going to set this apart is the segments. In the ray, you can see these segments. In the spine, you don't have those segments. Now these become important when we're working in the key and we want, when we want to identify things because usually this is one of our best characters for identifying some of these species is we need to count the rays and or the spines in certain fins and that's how we can tell one fish from another. The number one trick when counting rays is to light from behind. Usually you got to do this under a microscope. Um, if you got a big fish, if your eyes are good enough, you can hold it up to the light, but you need to have light coming from behind, and that really makes those rays pop out. When you count the rays, um, again, they're often branched, um, and you might be counting something, and it looks like two separate rays, but it really looks like they're going to join just below the surface. If that's true, you're going to count it as one. All right? And so if you look in this example, um, it's easiest to count near the base. If you count up near the margin of the fin, the rays usually branch and it's difficult to count. But down at the base, they're not branched. And so you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then here you've got two things coming together, but clearly they're gonna join just below the surface. So we count that as eight. You might wonder why I did not count this ray, and we'll get to that in a second but there are rules for different groups about whether or not you count that front ray. So this is kind of what it looks like when you put it under a microscope. And um, when you light it from behind, you can see how those rays pop out, but you usually need to use tweezers or something, forceps, to grab hold of it, make that fin stand up so that you can count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, looks like eight rays on this one. Now, as I said, whether or not you count this front ray varies, and it's somewhat confusing and somewhat annoying. But when you get to that point in the key where it's asking you to count rays, you should be able to figure it out. But this is from page 69 of your Fishes of Tennessee, just to show you what I'm talking about. And so here is where they're uh, if you go, go to your book and read this, this is where he's talking about the different counts. And let me highlight some things for you. For soft rays of the dorsal and anal fins, the small rudimentary rays at the origin of these fins are not included. So that's why I didn't count them in the earlier pictures. In counts for minnows and suckers. Why minnows and suckers? Well, they're closely related. And so their fins look very similar. Um, why do we not count that first short ray? Because it's difficult to see it sometimes. And so you only start with the larger ray. Now, that first large ray is usually unbranched, and then everything is branched after that. So let me back up. And you see in this drawing, you see that rudimentary ray we're not counting. The first principal ray is unbranched, and then afterwards they're all branched. And so those are the ones we count if this is a minnow or a sucker. And those are usually the ones that have these types of fins. And so this is what this slide is saying here. Um, that's why I didn't count that first ray. And the first principal ray is branched. And so here we do that again. This ray, you see this little short ray right here, I'm not counting but one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now, if you look at the next part of this paragraph, in other groups such as catfishes and top minnows, all anterior rays are usually included in counts. And so any ray is counted. Posteriorly, the last two small branched soft rays, if their bases are closer together than those of more anterior rays, usually share a common basal element and are conventionally counted as one. So that's what I was talking about earlier. If they seem to join just under the surface, you count it as one. And so that's in 
things like catfishes and top minnows. That's another groups where you're going to be using these counts. But you get to the bottom and it says, um, you know, again, those are on dorsal fin rays, median fins. Paired fin ray counts. All rays are included in counts of the pectoral and pelvic fin ray rays. So we're, we're talking about the different set of fins now. Except the small thin ray sometimes found bound tightly to the anterior aspect of the first large ray in these fins is included in counts for the pectoral fin, but not the pelvic. Okay, this drives me crazy, right? Um, but this is how it's done. Like I said, I want you to be aware of this when you're trying to count these rays. When you get to that point in the key, it'll make a lot of sense, all right? So, so when you get to the point and you're trying to count these rays and you're trying to remember this, just go back to page 69 in your book and it'll explain exactly what it wants you to count. Usually in the key, there's a drawing too that shows you exactly what they want you to count. So yeah, a little bit confusing, but not too bad. All right. I mentioned this earlier that not all species have a spinous and a soft dorsal fin, but if they do, the spinous fin is always anterior to the soft fin. Uh, other anatomical terms that we can use for the mouth, um, if you've got a mouth that's turned up, sort of like you're feeding at the surface, that's a superior mouth. Um, if it's right on the end, it's called terminal. And if it's underneath the head, it's called inferior or sometimes subterminal. Some species have barbels on their mouth and their chin. And so you just need to be aware of that. First example, this is a chub. And they often have a little flap, a little barbel right here in the corner of their mouth. And often you don't see it until you grab them by the bottom lip and open their mouth and that little barbel in the corner will go ding and it'll stick out. And so that's a trick for looking for that barbel. The creek chubs, which are shown here, that barbel is moved up into the groove of their lip. And so opening their mouth doesn't help so much, but if you put them under a scope and pull back their upper lip, you can see that little barbel. Uh, things like catfish are going to have tons of barbels. Um, all over the front of their face. And here are some other examples of barbels. So here you've got like a, a carp or yeah, there's a carp with mouth barbel. Again, a catfish. Sturgeon are often also going to have barbels. And so these are mostly covered in taste buds. And so they, you know, taste and smell are kind of the same thing in the aquatic environment. And so they're used for sensing chemicals in the water for the most part. Okay, uh, these um, hard pimples all over this fish's body are called breeding tubercles. Usually show up during the breeding season, usually show up on males. Um, often can be a diagnostic characteristic. So this looks like a stone roller, and there's a couple species of stone roller. And the number of barbels up here on the, or, uh, the tubercles up here on the head is a diagnostic characteristic. And these things are stiff. You run your hand over there, and it's very... Um, yeah, they're very hard nodules. You can see them on this live, this picture of a live fish. Okay, we mentioned the uh, brachiostigial membrane earlier. Um, it's like a fin, and it's a fin membrane, and so it needs support, and it's supported by rays just like the fins. Um, they're called brachiostigial rays, and so sometimes um, we want to count the number of those to help us identify fish, like in the Isosidae but it's very similar to the fin and how they work. Now we're looking at the ventral uh, view of the head, so we turn the fish over and looking from the bottom. And uh, that isthmus I mentioned is that point of the body that kind of sticks out and connects the lower part of the body to the head. And sometimes we're going to look at how the, the shape of the isthmus um, in this example here, we're looking at the brachiostigial rays, so you can see how you've got that membrane supported by these rays. You can see the rays here. And again, it's flexible, so it allows the opercular cavity to expand and contract. Um, as I mentioned, you can look at the shape of how these uh, 
brachiostigial membranes are joined to help identify some fish. So here you've got broadly joined. You can see that they're connected. Um, you know, they're, they're very widely connected, very broadly connected. Here they're connected, but not so much. There's a little bit of a deeper cut in them. Here they're separate, so they're not joined at all. The left and right branchiostigial membranes are not connected. You can see the isthmus is extends way up. And here you can see where they're attached, that there um, is not much of an opening. It's fused all the way along the bottom. So things like darters, we're going to be looking at this to help identify different darters. And here's another example of gill membrane attachments, right? You can see attached here, or here you can see attached, here's broadly joined, narrowly joined, or separate. Uh, here, this one is separate here. And these two are broadly joined or attached on this side. Um, if you look at the front face of a lot of fish, many fish have a protractile mouth, which means that they can extend their upper jaw, their lower jaw, think duck face, you know, they can stick their lips out. Um, but some species have what's known as a frenum, and the frenum is a bridge of skin that attaches that upper jaw to the head, which means they can't extend the upper jaw, they can only extend the bottom jaw. And so that upper lip, uh, the upper jaw is called the premaxillary. Um, and so this is an important characteristic when we're trying to identify darters, is do they have a frenum or don't have a frenum? But that also you know, influences what they can do with their mouth and consequently what they can eat. And that's what I just mentioned, the premaxillary is the name of that upper jaw. Here's another picture of a fish that has a frenum. And so you can see that because of that bridge of skin, it's not going to be able to stick its upper lip out, whereas this one could stick out its uh, upper lip. It has a protractile premaxillary. And it's not always easy to see in darters, but we're going to use this a lot for the darters. Okay, we mentioned the lateral line earlier. We can look at the lateral line and see several. We can describe it in different ways, or different fish have different types of lateral line. This first one, A, is a complete lateral line. Um, B is incomplete, so you see that it stops before it reaches the tip of the caudal region. C is an interrupted lateral line, so it kind of runs the length, but there's big gaps in it. Uh, in D, we've got arched, and so it presumably to, to kind of, so, you know, so it's not interfered with by the uh, uh, pectoral fin here. It's arched upward, or it can be depressed, curved ventrally. So it's called curve, you, you could say it's curved ventrally or depressed. And so these are different ways to describe your lateral line. Okay. Next thing we need to talk about is scales. And so as we get into different species, we're going to get into more detail about the different types of scales, but let's talk about them in general for right now. Scales in fish are formed from the dermis, which is a deeper layer of tissue on the integument, the outer covering. Reptiles also have scales, but their scales are different in that they're formed from the epidermis, or the outer layer of the integument. Scales are homologous with teeth, or, or uh, uh, teeth and scales sort of came from the same structure. They came from a common ancestor. So if you can imagine uh, scales and, and, and an organism with scales that are in the mouth, and then um, they slowly evolve into teeth. So they kind of came from the same common ancestor. Remember that our early fish had dermal armor, or a heavy external armor. And so that armor then began to break into small pieces, which made it more flexible. And some of those pieces that were in the mouth became teeth. So this dermal armor um, got lighter and more flexible as it broke into smaller and smaller pieces, which eventually became scales. There are different kinds of scales. 
that we see on different species. So this first example is a placoid scale. This is what's found in a lot of cartilaginous fish like sharks. And it's very different than a bony fish scale. It's kind of a protrusion that sticks up. So here's like a side view. And so if you look at that placoid scale, you see it's got a layer of dentine. You see it's erupting through the epidermis. It's got a pulp cavity. It's coming from the dermis, right? And so it's got kind of a root and then it erupts through the epidermis. It's got an enamel covering. What's that sound like? Sounds a lot like a tooth, right? And so the general anatomy of a placoid scale is very similar to a tooth. You can see again how these erupt and stick out of the fish and give sharks that characteristic rough surface. But we'll talk about later, we talk about hydrodynamics, that this rough surface actually is more hydrodynamically efficient so they can swim better. Next type of scale we're going to mention here is the ganoid scale. It's kind of a diamond-shaped scale, a tougher scale. Um, this is in bony fish like gars have these ganoid scales. Uh, characteristic of the ganoid scale too is that they don't overlap. So they're not like shingles. They like they're like uh, they lay next to each other and they're very stiff. The type of scale you're mostly familiar with are cycloid scales. Um, so this is a typical cycloid or circular scale. You'll find it in lots of fish species, for example, minnows, which are probably no longer in the family Cyprinidae. Or there are still some Cyprinids, but some of our Cyprinids got moved to a new family. Another type of scale that's common in fish here in Kentucky uh, is the tenoid scale. And it's a lot like a, a circular scale um, or a cycloid scale. But it has these little bumps, these little teni on the end. So again, it's a little bit like this placoid scale. It's giving a roughness to the outer surface of the fish, which actually makes the fish a little bit more efficient in moving through the water. And um, here's some examples again of a type of ganoid scale called a scoot, and a cycloid scale, and a, and a tenoid scale. But also, we're showing you a lateral line scale. So when you look at a fish, you can sort of see the lateral line. But what, what forms that lateral line? It's actually a canal underneath the scales. And it's based upon, it's used to sense vibrations in the water. And we're going to talk about this in more detail later. But that water needs to touch that canal. And so the lateral line scales have little holes in them. And so if you ever look at a scale, you can identify whether or not it's a lateral line scale by the little groove and the little hole that's in it. And so um, here's just another picture showing these different type of scales. This is a stained tenoid scale. This is from uh, Chase Gilbert, a former student here at Murray. And he does a lot of clearing and staining and, and high quality photography. And he's got his website down here where he sells pictures of these. But um, you can see very clearly uh, the teni on this scale. And these scales do overlap like shingles, and it's this rough part, this teni, that is the exposed part. So this part of the scale is usually underneath the scale next to it. It's not exposed. Uh, here's just kind of showing you, again, give you a feel, the, the construction of a ganoid scale versus a cycloid or a tenoid scale. And so um, ganoid have a tough enamel called ganoin that gives them, they're, they're very stiff. And you can see in this picture of a gar how they don't overlap, how they butt up against each other. Whereas your cycloid and tenoid scales are overlapping like roof shingles. And they have a different kind of enamel that's a lot, uh, it's more flexible than ganoin. Um, again, you can see these things coming from the dermis, not the epidermis, but the cycloid and tenoid scales are more flexible, lighter, and presumably that gave their ancestors a, an evolutionary advantage. They were able to swim faster and, and be more nimble in the water. And so the first scales were the placoid scales. And these evolved from that dermal armor. So that dermal armor got lighter 
and more and more flexible to become placoid scales, which then became even lighter and even more flexible. Uh, there's a type of scale found in the fossils called a cosmoid scale, um, and we have not seen any of those, but they're they they're just in the fossil record. Um, no fish has a cosmoid scale anymore. The cosmoid was the precursor to the ganoid, and then the ganoid became the very thin and light cycloid and tenoid. And so these ganoid scales are found in things like gar, which are uh, an older linear of, lineage of fish. And so in general, when you talk about scale evolution, the trend was from heavy external armor to lighter, thinner, um, more flexible outer covering. But simultaneously, the endoskeleton began to develop and become harder. And so earlier fish were hard on the outside and soft on the inside. And over time, they became softer on the outside, but harder on the inside that they developed that endoskeleton. And that presumably is one of the reasons why they became more successful. Okay, um, we can age fish by using the scales. And so if you look at a scale under a microscope, here's a tenoid scale. Um, and you can see the center of it is called the focus. And then these lines that radiate perpendicular to the edge of the scale are called radii. And then circling the focus are these circuli. And during the colder months, those circuli tend to grow close to each other and pile up, and that forms an annulus. And so by looking at the scale under a scope, you can count the annuli just like counting the rings on a tree. You can tell how old the fish is. There are many structures we can use to age fish, and we'll talk about them all as we come to them. Okay, finally, um, you're going to need to know, um, you don't need to memorize this so much, but these are things that you're going to use when you're working through the key. And so a lot of times you're going to need to do scale counts. And so they're going to ask about the circumferential scale rows. And so that would be anterior to the dorsal and around the body. You're going to count how many rows of scales you have. Um, the same thing with circumpeduncular. So you go around the caudal peduncle and count how many scales you have. Sometimes, a lot of times, we'll be counting the lateral line scales and how many of those scales you have. So these are things that help us tell one species from another. Um, sometimes it'll ask about how many rows are above the lateral line. And so you would do that between the lateral line and the dorsal fin. Uh, transverse scale rows are farther back on the body. Um, Here's circumpeduncular again. Here's scale rows below the lateral line. And lateral scale rows or lateral line scales again. So these are just, you know, when you're in the key and it starts to ask you how many scale rows are in each of these areas, this is what they're talking about. Um, so then finally, again, this is, not, this is not something that you need to memorize each of these but you should refer back to this uh, image whenever you're working through the key. And so you'll see that it's showing you like the total length and the standard length again. Um, but these are a lot of the measurements that you're going to use when you're trying to key out a fish. The dorsal fin length, the post orbit length, uh, the snout length, head length, uh, cheek scale row count. You see we're, we're talking about that area below the eye, but not onto the opercular cover. Um, body depth is uh, the entire depth of the fish, um, where the lateral, where the dorsal fin uh, origin is. Again, you see scales above and below the lateral line. So this is on page 68 of Fishes of Tennessee. Whenever it asks for these kind of counts or measurements, refer back to this to know what they're talking about. Okay, so um, that's a lot of the external anatomy, a lot of the things that you're going to use in the key. Let me know if you got any questions, and I'll see you later.